Justified anger. What do you think? Is anger ever justified? Well, sometimes it is. There's righteous anger. We see that in the scriptures. Paul writes and says, be angry and don't sin. Jesus never sinned, and he was angry with what was taking place in the temple as God's people were getting ripped off and turned to the tables. So there's times where there is righteous anger, but I don't know about you, most of the time when I get angry, sin is at the door. Sin usually accompanies anger. What we find with Jonah the prophet is he's extremely angry in verse 1 of of chapter 4, and he's angry at God. As this story has uh, developed, God told him to go to Nineveh, the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. He didn't want anything to do with that because they were the enemies of Israel. So he goes in the opposite direction, goes to Tarsus, fleeing God's call, goes to the bottom of the, the boat. God sends a storm, He's thrown overboard into the sea. God prepared this great fish to swallow up Jonah. He's in the belly of this fish for three days, three nights before he gets right with God. That's stubborn. And then it's the pivotal point of the book. It's my favorite verse in Jonah. It's when the great fish has the urge to regurge. The Bible says vomit. And Jonah is in the right direction. He's going up. Second chance. God gives a second chance to Jonah, calls him back to Nineveh. Nineveh gives God's message. Repent or judgment is coming in in 40 days. And surprisingly, the whole city of Nineveh, this pagan city, this violent community, evil, turns to the Lord, gets serious about their repentance before God, and God is gracious and he withholds his judgment upon Nineveh And that's where we pick up in verse 1 of of chapter 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he became angry. This is not what you would expect. This is possibly the largest revival that's ever recorded. The, The whole city, this giant city, responds to this message of God from the greatest to the least. Most of the time when you're bringing the message of God to someone and they respond, they rejoice. We rejoice, right? The angels rejoice when one sinner repents, but not Jonah. He wants the Ninevites to be judged. He doesn't want them to be forgiven. And so he's displeased exceedingly, and he became angry. In the Hebrew, he's hot. I mean, he's not just simmering, but he's, he's hot. He's, he's ticked off, he's upset, and he's upset towards God. And sometimes we may get frustrated with how God deals in our lives and lives with others. Have you ever wrestled with, Lord, why are you being merciful to them? They've wronged me. They've, they've sinned against me. They deserve judgment. They deserve justice. But yet, God, you're being merciful to them. I, I feel like I'm doing the right thing, but yet I'm getting these negative consequences. And we can be in that place of Jonah where we come to this moment of frustration with the way God is dealing and working in our lives and the lives of of others. In verse 2, so he prayed to the Lord and said, this is an important point to pause. So he prayed to the Lord and said, he could have distanced himself from the Lord in his anger like he did in chapter 1. In chapter 1, he's, he's frustrated that God would call him to go to Nineveh, and he doesn't cry out to the Lord. I think Jonah has learned something here to come to the Lord in his frustrations and pray. Maybe the apex of unbelief is silence before God. When we get to a place where we're not even conversing with the Lord, we come up with ideas like, well, what does it really matter to pray? God's going to do what he wants anyway, and we get indifferent in our relationship uh, with the Lord. Jonah's not in the right place. His heart's not in the right place, but at least he's turning to the Lord. At least he's going to God with his frustration. When we look at the scriptures, there's a big portion that's dedicated to the people of God lamenting, the people of God wrestling with sorrow and difficulty in their lives and and trying to figure out the ways of God in their life. And I think a lot of times as an American culture, we don't know what to do with that. We don't know how to enter into that space to lament and, and to come honestly before the Lord. We look at the Psalms 152 psalms, and a majority of those psalms are dedicated to lament. 
They're, they're dedicated to, Lord, I don't understand what's, what's going on here. And as the psalmist is talking with the Lord, there's a perspective change. And a lot of times in that honest conversation, it moves the psalmist to a place of, of trust. There's a whole book of the Bible devoted to lament. It's called Lamentations. It's Jeremiah the prophet. And he's so honest with the Lord that he's saying, God, I feel like the prey and you're the predator. God, I feel like you're out to get me. And this is the man of God who's dedicated his life to serve the Lord, but it didn't go the way that he thought that it would. No one was responding to the message of God. And he's being persecuted and he's watching God's people be taken into captivity. And in that process of lamenting, he meets uh, with the Lord. How about you? Are you able to, to bring your frustrations? Are you able to bring your genuine heart to the Lord? We're talking with God, and, and so we need to make sure we're respectful. We need to make sure that we're humble. But I see in Scripture so many examples where God invites us to be honest. He already knows we're angry. He already knows that we're, we're frustrated. So we're not doing ourselves any favors to stuff it or hide it. Like Jonah, come to the Lord. Have an honest conversation with him, and then allow the Lord to share with us. Continuing in verse 2, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I have fled previously to Tarsus, for I knew that you are gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Jonah is appreciative of God's grace and mercy in his life, but he resents it in the life of his enemies. And that's often the case for us. I have this habit where it's hard for me to ditch old t-shirts. I'm a, I'm a t-shirt guy. And I'll wear like t-shirts like five years way too long. And my wife's coming to me like, hey, it's time to get rid of that t-shirt. Sometimes my kids will even be like, hey, dad, like seriously, get, get rid of that shirt. It's nasty. And I'm like, no, it's just worn in. It's just, it's just right, right? But if I were to see you wear one of my nasty t-shirts, I'd be like, bro, come on. It's time for a new shirt. Like, what's, what's wrong with you? And that's a lot of times the way it is with our sin. My sin on me doesn't look so bad. But my sin on you, it looks really bad. I'm like, hey, what's going on there? You need to get your act together. We love God's grace. We love God's mercy in our lives. How gracious has God been to Jonah? He's the lost prophet. He's not where he's supposed to be. God could have easily allowed him to die in the storm, but instead God sent this great fish to save his life. God supernaturally preserves him in the belly of this great fish. I don't think it's normal to be able to live in the belly of a great fish. I mean, God's grace to Jonah, that God would give Jonah a second chance that the gifting and calling of God would remain in his life. So much grace, so much forgiveness, so much loving kindness, but now Jonah can't extend this to someone else. Jonah gets the character of God right. He understands this is who God is. Moses asked to see the glory of the Lord in Exodus 33 and 34. And God says to, to Moses, you can only see my backside. You can't see my face and, and live. God passes before Moses and then expresses his character. This is Exodus 34, verse 6. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and in truth. And Jonah recognizes that this is the character of God, that God is gracious that he's merciful, that he's slow to anger. And this is what caused Jonah to disobey in the first place. He didn't want to go to Nineveh because he knew that God's heart was to forgive. And now his worst nightmare is coming to pass. In verse 3, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. Jonah's at this place of saying, God, I would rather die than see the Ninevites forgiven. He goes back to a similar place that he was in in chapter one, where he's like, I would rather die than obey the Lord. I would rather die than get right with the Lord and go to Nineveh. 
And just like we have several examples in scripture of people being honest uh, with God, with their frustrations and their heart not being in the right place, there's also a lot of servants of God that got to a place where they didn't want to live any longer. They didn't see the, the point in living and they're asking God to take their life. But I want to point out a distinction here is Jonah is asking God to take his life, but he's not taking his own life. And there, there's a big difference. And the enemy wants to get us to a place where we're so hopeless that we start considering taking our own life. But our life doesn't belong to us. We're created by God. Jesus bought us with his blood. So it's not for us to take our life. If you take your own life, it, it is murder. And that's not God's heart. And that's not God's intent. And, and hopefully by God's grace and his strength, we can build a fortitude around our hearts and minds to say, you know, suicide's not an option. It doesn't glorify the Lord. There's also this lie that comes to a lot of people where if I weren't here, it would be easier for my family and my friends. I'm, I'm a burden. I'm struggling so much that I'm a burden to the ones that I love. I don't want to be a burden. Having done memorial services for several people that have committed suicide, it is very difficult upon the family. It breaks the heart of moms and dads and brothers and sisters and spouse. And, and some of you have gone through that. You, you've had a loved one commit suicide. Never believe that lie that you're, you're a burden to your family and friends. And, and God is the God of hope and he's the author of life. And if we get to this place where we don't want to live any longer, we go to the Lord and we cry out to the Lord and we say, God, would you give me me strength, but suicide's not an option. Elijah felt the same way. He, pro he confronted the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. An amazing victory. Jezebel sends him a text message, you're a dead man. And he gets freaked out. He gets afraid and he runs for his life. And he prays the same thing for, as Jonah, God, take, take my life. Job, he cursed the day of his birth. He's like, why was I ever born? I don't see any purpose in all of this. You may be familiar with Johnny Erickson Tata. She was 17 years old and she dove into shallow water and became a paraplegic. And in those next few weeks, uh, she struggled with suicide and attempted suicide. Didn't see the value of continuing to live in this paraplegic state. And she writes that one night she cried out to God and she says, God, if I can't die teach me to live. Isn't that powerful? And now she has this long legacy of years and years and years and years, decades of serving the Lord, of using this platform of being a paraplegic to be able to inspire people with the love of Jesus Christ, just an amazing woman of God. And if you're at that place of saying, man, I don't, I don't want to live any longer, take that prayer of Johnny Erickson Tata and cry out to the Lord, Lord, I can't die. It's not for me to take my own life. So teach me how to live. Show me what you have for my life. Show me how to be able to endure in this pain. And it's not like Johnny Erickson taught his life got easier. There was continued suffering and continues to be suffering in her life, but the Lord taught her how to live. In verse four, then the Lord says, is it right for you to be angry? God is so patient with Jonah. It would be easy for, for God to come down upon Jonah, but he asks a, a question as a loving father. Is it right for you, Jonah, to be angry? Why are you angry that I've chosen to be gracious to the Ninevites? Don't, don't I have the right to be gracious if I so choose to, to do so? And this is oftentimes how God deals with us as he deals with people in the scriptures is through a question. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden? The father shows up to fellowship with them in the cool of the day, and what does he say? He says, where are you? He knew exactly where they were, but it's this question of pursuit. It's this opportunity for confession. When Cain kills Abel, he goes to Abel and says, what have you done? He knew exactly what Abel had done. But he asks that, that question. He asks of the prophet Isaiah, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah had to wrestle with that question. With the disciples, he asked, 
who do you say that I am? They had to wrestle with who really is, is Christ. And Peter responds and says, you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Judas comes. Jesus looks at Jesus and says, are you going to betray me with a kiss? Jesus knew exactly what Judas was going to do. It was that moment for, for Judas to be able to get, get right. Jesus confronts Saul and says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? We need to have honest conversations with God where we're asking those real questions of the Lord and maybe lamenting in humility and respect, but we also need to receive questions from the Lord. I think a lot of times we want to ask questions of God, but we don't really expect God to get in our personal space and bring us a, a, a question in response. Job was wrestling in his suffering. And God questions him at the end of the book and says, where were you at the foundation of the world? I, I was on vacation. You know, I was at a VRBO. I, I wasn't there. Ultimately, God's showing Job, hey, there's a lot of things here that you don't understand and you don't know. And, and God will come to us with loving questions that dig into our hearts. In verse 5, so Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. Jonah doesn't engage. Jonah doesn't answer this question, is it right for you to be angry? Instead, he goes out of the city and he's hoping that judgment's going to come. Maybe God's going to change his mind and not forgive the Ninevites. There could have been another response. We have a whole city full of new believers. <laughs> and Jonah could have went in and loved on them. He could have discipled them. He could have pointed them to the Lord. But instead, he's out in isolation, watching with his arms crossed, saying, well, well maybe, maybe God's going to ultimately bring judgment. There is a, a time for moments of isolation, seasons of isolation, where we get away to be refreshed and be with the Lord. Jesus would get away to be with the Father. But if we're angry and we're upset and we move to a place of isolation and we're frustrated with God and we're frustrated with others, that's not the place that God wants us to be. God's called us into relationship with him and with people. And it's a dangerous place if you find yourself intentionally choosing isolation out of anger and frustration. And that's exactly where, where Jonah's at. In verse 6, And the Lord prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. This is the first time we've seen Jonah be happy in the whole book. Right? Why is he happy? Because God prepared a plant. God's going to speak to Jonah through this plant. We know that Nineveh is in modern day Iraq. It's very hot. He's sitting out in the hot sun there in the Middle East. And God provides this plant. It grows supernaturally quick and fast. And he's got some shade. And it's when his needs are met that he's happy. I find myself in the story of Jonah. A lot of times we're like, Lord, thank you so much for your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness in my life. Lord, thank you for the, the shade that you've provided. My needs are met, so I'm happy and fry the Ninevites. Lord, I, I'm so frustrated with this person. I'm so frustrated with the way our, our culture's going. And, and God, when are, when are you going to bring judgment? And I, I can't believe this person did this to me and this person did that to me. And really where Jonah has come is he's very self-focused. He, he's felt focused on what he wants and his needs to be met. Sometimes God will speak to us very supernaturally in the natural. It's natural that there would be this plant and this shade. And God's going to set this all up to confront Jonah's heart. God in his grace is continuing to pursue Jonah. The primary way that God speaks to us is through his word, but there'll be some times where God speaks to us through the circumstances of our lives. Well, what, what's God wanting to say to me through this? He'll speak to us supernaturally through, through the natural. In verse seven, 
But as the morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm, and so it damaged the plant and it withered. God prepared. Just like God sent the storm, God prepared the great fish, God planted this plant to grow, but now he sends a worm to devour the plant. And this worm is able to eat enough of the plant where it's damaged and it, and it withers. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, it's better for me to die than to live. God gives and he takes away. We love it when God gives. He gave his son. We're going to celebrate communion this morning. There's no, no greater gift. We love it when God blesses with, with family and friends and provision and eternal life. God gives. But does he have the right to take away? You know, Jonah loved it when God planted the plant. But God can take away the plant as well. And Job, as he loses his children and his possessions, he worships and says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. God plants the plant, but he also can take it away if he desires. And God turns up the heat on Jonah. What's interesting is Jonah is hot. Jonah's angry. And so God now turns the heat up on Jonah. Wind is nice unless it's really, really hot. There's nothing really more miserable than a hot wind blowing on you. God just takes a hair dryer and is like, okay, Jonah. And Jonah's not getting the message here. He, he's not understanding what God's doing. He just keeps going to this place of, man, I wish I was dead. It was better for me to die than to live. And God once again confronts him. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Jonah, are you responding to this the right way? Is it, is it appropriate for you to be angry about this plan? And he said, is it right for you to be angry even to death? Jonah, you need to let go of this anger. Is it right for you to be angry to this point even unto death? Now, as you examine possibly what are some things that are going on in your heart that cause you to a place where you don't want to live any longer, could one of those things be anger? Life just didn't turn out the way that I thought that it, it would. And where was God in the midst of this? And, and how could God a, allow this? And I'm frustrated and I'm angry. And that may not always be the case, but that was the case for Jonah. His anger got the best of him to the point where he didn't even see the value of living. He couldn't see what God was doing in the midst of the Ninevites. But the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. Jonah, you have compassion. You have pity upon this plant. You're, you're mourning over the fact that this plant isn't here. I'm trying to, to get your attention here. In verse 11, and should I not pity Nineveh, the great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? God says, is it okay for me to pity Nineveh? You didn't plant the plant. You didn't labor for the plant. Look what I've got invested in Nineveh. It's 120,000 plus people. I love them. I've created them. I'm, I long for them to be in relationship with me. There's an interesting phrase here that caught my attention. It says, who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock. So they're so confused. They're like, what's my right hand and what's my, my left hand? They've gotten so far from God and so evil as a, a culture that nothing made sense. Isn't that exactly where we're at? Couldn't we say of the United States of America that we can't even discern right from left? As a culture, we won't even come out and say male and female. It's obvious male and it's obvious female. It's very clear. Biological male, biological female. I'll probably get hate mail for saying bi biological male and biological female, but it's common sense. It's the way that God has 
designed us and, and created us. But we're in a place of such confusion that we're like, I don't know. I don't know what biological male, what do you mean by male? What do you mean by, by female? Which way's right and which way's left? And what's right is now wrong and what's wrong is now right. And guess what? That, that was Nineveh, right? But we see God's heart towards Nineveh and we see our God's heart towards this culture where God is wanting to, to save. God is wanting to bring people out of darkness and into the marvelous light. That's why God sent Jonah. And that's why God is, is sending us. And we need to be reminded as believers, you know, what pit did God rescue you from? I was talking with a, a teenage guy yesterday. I met him for the first time and he was sharing that he's new in the faith. And I was excited. I was like, wow, that's, that's awesome. You know, and, and he, he's probably 17 or so years old. And he's like, you know, I, I really messed things up to get to this place where I would, would trust Christ. And I was like, me too, bro. That was my story when I was a teenager, right? And that's all of our stories. Like we're sinners and we're separated from God and God in his grace saved us. And there's not that God ranks and files sinners, where he's like, ooh, that's a real bad one over there. That's a not so bad sinner over there. That, that sinner really deserves judgment, but that one over there just barely deserves judgment. But that's kind of our perspective, is we want to rack and stack sin. God says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So God saved us by his grace. And his love's not just for us. His love is, is for the world. To, Jonah missed God's heart. Jonah missed something in his relationship with God. He so stumbled about the heart of God that he's gotten to a place where he's angry with how the Lord is dealing with people. He's upset with the core characteristic of who God is, that God is gracious and he's merciful and he's long-suffering. Yes, God will bring judgment. And when judgment falls, it's a very serious thing. But God means it when he says that he doesn't want any to perish. He doesn't want any to go to hell. He doesn't delight in the death of the wicked. God's not sitting up in heaven going, oh, I just can't wait to judge the United States of America. I believe that's coming at some point. I mean, we're ripe for judgment. But God much more wants to bring people to a place of salvation and grace. And we've seen from Saul's life in the book of Acts, and we see now from the Ninevites, that no one is beyond God's ability to save. God saves to the uttermost. What's humbling about chapter 4 is we don't see the response of Jonah. The last words of Jonah, the, the last recorded words of Jonah is it'd be better for me to die than live. Did he respond to the correction of God? Did he respond to this conversation that the Lord had with him? We don't know. I sure hope so. But Jonah may have continued in a place of frustration. He may have continued in a place of a hard heart with the Lord. How did the rest of Israel respond to God forgiving the Ninevites? This is recorded for us in scripture this book got out to the, the Israelites, this story they knew. Were they frustrated with God? Like, God, you forgave our, our enemies? Or did they come to understand the character and nature of the Lord? We're going to take communion together and, and be served. So the men are going to come and, and serve us. And when we're all served, we're going to take communion together. And I think it's a perfect application of the message this morning. And for us to be able to come to the communion table and first remember that God is good. God is good. What anchors us when we don't understand God's ways? I can guarantee you there's going to be some experiences in your life, it's probably already happened, where you're like, Lord, I really don't understand what you're doing. I don't know why things are going down this way. And hopefully we come to a place where we can trust God because God is good. And how do we know that God is good? How do we know that we know that we know that God is good? It's the cross of Jesus Christ. 
And we're going to hold the bread in our hands and the cup in our hands, and it reminds us of Jesus' broken body, that he was broken for us, that his blood was shed for us so that we could be forgiven. So God, I don't understand this difficulty in my life, but I don't also understand how you could love me and how good and how gracious you are to me. So I'm holding on to your character that you are good, even though I don't understand this trial or difficulty in my life. If we lose hold of the fact that God is good in the midst of trial, that's when trial gets extremely difficult. That's what we're fighting for. If you're in this place of Jonah where you're really wrestling with what God's doing in your life, what you fight for is that knowledge that God is good. And you press into that communion today. And in faith, go, God, I know you're good because you've given your son for me. But also, as we take communion, we understand that Jesus' love is for the world. His love is for the world. His love is for the Ninevites. And maybe is there a person that you've just tuned out? There's a group of people that you've said, you know, I'm okay if God would, would judge them. Those are the kind of things we would never say out loud. But that's where we want to get our hearts aligned with the heart of God. We don't want to make the same mistake as Jonah and miss the heart of God. Say, Lord, you've been gracious to me. So Lord, help me to have that gracious heart towards others. So let's pray. We're going to prepare our hearts for communion. Jesus, we, we thank you so much for the, your sacrifice. We ask that you would meet us this morning in communion as we remember your, your broken body and your shed blood, and as we wrestle through circumstances in our lives, we come back to the anchor that you're good. And would you expand our hearts for the world? Lord, would you forgive us for having a hard heart towards others, of receiving your grace, but then wanting your judgment in other people's lives? And for those that we need to forgive, for those that we need to extend mercy to, would would you meet us? Just continue in an attitude of prayer. And if you're at a place where you're ready to receive Christ as your Savior, we're talking about judgment and Jesus dying for our sins. And before we take communion, if, if you've never said yes to Jesus, you know, my heart was pretty hard towards the Lord growing up. I grew up in a Christian family, went to Christian school, and didn't want anything to do with Christ. And what changed my life was this truth that God loved me when I didn't want anything to do with him. And as you look at your heart, maybe your heart's been hard towards the Lord, or maybe it's just been kind of indifferent, where you're like, I don't really know if Jesus is for me. And this morning, I, I want to give you an opportunity to choose to believe. And Jesus was very clear, there's a heaven and there's a hell. And our sin is, does deserve an eternal punishment, but God doesn't want you to go to hell. He wants you to go to heaven, but he gives you a choice. Do you want light? Do you want Jesus? Do you want forgiveness? Do you want him to be the Lord of your life? So I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to Christ, not to me, but to Jesus, if this makes sense to you, to lift your hand to Christ, to leave it up. Also for those that are watching online, respond right where you're at, lift your hand to Jesus. So if that's you this morning, just raise your hand, leave it up, Make eye contact with me and I'm going to lead you in a prayer to receive Christ as your Savior. So just wait for a few moments. Praise God. Awesome. Praise the Lord. Thank you for responding. Praise the Lord. Awesome. Praise God. Anybody else this morning? Praise the Lord. Awesome. Thank you. Praise God. Pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I believe that you're God, that you died for my sins and rose again. I turn from my sin and receive your grace and forgiveness. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Be the Lord of my life. God, I thank you for those that have responded to the gospel. Thank you for your promise to save them. Lord, would you fill them with your spirit and walk with them in this new relationship. In Jesus' name, amen.